that this is case uh, 31. So we have a punch biopsy, see a little collection of blood right there, mm -hmm. a little bit of clot, also see little discrete eccrine coils kind of throughout here. Let's look at the blood first. So I'm seeing, you know, thinner walled vascular spaces, at least in this larger area, it actually looks more like a lymphatic ectasia. Um, yeah, it, it does, like... right. It looks a lot like lymphatic. And this is a good example of that phenomenon I was mentioning earlier. See, if you just had this picture right here, you'd say, oh, it's lymphatic, but there's lots of uh, blood in it. And probably if we did a stain, these would stain not lymphatic because this is probably the blood, the red cells are separating out from the serum, like, like it happens if you centrifuge blood, you know? It's just happening naturally here since this has been taken out of the body and sitting in formalin for, you know, a day or something maybe, and then process so that time to separate like that a little bit. But yeah, good point. I like that you, the overlap, it, it can be pretty striking sometimes. Good. So yeah, dilated cavernous channels here. Maybe some have a little bit of a muscular layer around them. Others are very thin. And there's also some like fibrosis and inflammation, right? And look, like right here, this is good to bring up. See, there's like some increased spindle cells. This is kind of almost like early scar granulation tissue. You can see those kind of changes in vascular lesions in normal, in, in not normal vessels, but in vessels as a reactive phenomenon. This is kind of like akin to like intimal hyperplasia. It, you can see it in, in arteries because of hypertension. You can see it in vascular lesions because they either have hemorrhaged or ruptured. See, there's evidence of hemorrhage right there, hemocytorin. And so then you can begin to see this hypercellular zones where you're getting extra endothelial cells and some reactive myofibroblasts. And it can kind of have overlapping features with organizing thrombus sometimes. So seeing all that stuff uh, in the middle of a vascular lesion is totally normal and pretty common to see, especially in, in various malformations that have kind of bled into themselves. Sorry, so back to what you were saying. Yes, uh, these vascular spaces here. I think there's some other areas where we have some maybe other stuff going on. I'm just looking at these orbs kind of around it, of, or surrounding it. Of the eccrine yeah. coils as well, which, you know, don't really have the angiomata spaces mixed in with them. Very good. I agree with you, in fact. So this is labeled one way in the answer key, and I... I think you could make the argument that it might represent an eccrine angiomatous hamartoma, but um, I personally kind of wonder if it's maybe just a benign vascular malformation, or yeah. you could also call this a cavernous hemangioma if you wanted to. I feel like those kind of overlapping terms. The big cavernous spaces, thin walled, some with low muscular lining. It's probably a malformation the person's had since they were born. Um, usually eccrine angiomatous hamartoma, I find that they're a little hard to diagnose because they are they are normal things. The question is just, is there enough of both entities intermingle with each other to call it that fancy name? So I've seen a fair number of times where stuff has been labeled that, and I'm like, yeah, maybe. The ones I had seen have a lot of eccrine coils and have vascular channels intermingled with the dermis and the eccrine coils. And here, I feel like we're seeing more of a solitary nodule of vascular malformation here that just has some more prominent eccrine coils around it. So you could make the argument that there may be more eccrine coils here than normal, right, for this amount of skin, so that maybe it represents something on the spectrum with eccrine angioma hamartoma. But I, I personally would think probably I would call this just a, as, as fun as it would be to give it a fancier name, I'd probably say it's just a benign vascular malformation that happens to have some kind of more prominent eccrine coils around it. I think you could make an argument either way um, but I, I would like to take a moment to point out, though, that this change around eccrine coils is kind of interesting, and I feel like I see this pretty often, in, particularly in the distal extremities. As you get close to the hands and feet, you often get abundant myxoid change or mucin in the stroma around the eccrine coil, and it kind of splays apart and dilates the, the, the space the coil takes up and pushes the coil, each individual tubule, apart from each other. I do not know why this happens. It's so frequent, I feel like, in the distal extremities that I wonder if it is just a normal variation there. 
I also feel like I see it in settings where there's inflammation or reactive process happening nearby. So I've also come to think that maybe it is more abundant, uh, this stuff happens in the setting of reactive processes, but I do not have a good answer for you. If you're watching this online and you know some great literature about this, I'd love to have a link posted down below to that article. Because I've, I've observed this a lot over the years and I feel like people see it and if they've not noticed it before, they're like, whoa, what is going on with the Eccrine coil? But if you once you know that this can happen, you'll start looking and you'll encounter this. I think I see it a little more often maybe in soft tissue cases where they're going way down deep, like taking a, a you know something from the synovium above the ankle and they happen to get some skin and they've got some bursitis or something on the foot, things like that. And then I see, oh, these big, you know, mixoidy expanded eccrine coils in the background. So I feel like maybe I encounter it more than other people in Dermpath because I also do soft tissue and see these larger, deeper excision specimens that we don't see as often in derm paths. So uh, just so you know that, that that's a weird phenomenon that I don't know that it means anything. Also, I would point out this is a faded slide, so you can't tell, but it, on a new H&E, this is almost certainly mixoid, blue mucin mixoid hyaluronic acid. And around eccrine coils, I ignore blue mucin or mixoid material. I do not use that as evidence of connective tissue disease like lupus. I find that it is normal to have a variable amount of mixoid material around here, just like you see it in the lining of a nerve inside the perineurium. In those settings, I totally ignore it, and I don't use that as a useful clue to diagnose lupus at all. I will only use, you know, A, having the right inflammatory pattern, and also interstitial mucin. That's where I'm looking. But I think this comes up sometimes, and so in my book, I just ignore any mucin around the eccrine coil as not being helpful to be a point towards connective tissue disease. Obviously not related to this context of this case here, but I just thought it was a good time to bring it up while I was thinking of it. And since I've been verbose on you know, every other single case this morning for the past three hours, why not on the last one?